Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Jessica Williams. Uh, my name is Jessica Williams, and I'm the programming manager at the California Historical Society. Thank you so much for joining us for our program this evening, Elaine Bacchioneta, A California Story, a conversation with author Rachel Schreiber and archivist Tanya Wallace. Welcome, everyone. Um, before we do anything else, I'd like to acknowledge that the California Historical Society is headquartered in San Francisco in the unceded territory of the Ramatush Ohlone. It is our job at CHS not only to remember this fact, but also to make California's rich, complicated, and diverse past a meaningful part of contemporary life. We do this through public programs like this one, through our research library and collections, and by hosting exhibitions. We currently have two exhibitions on view, Chinese Pioneers, Power and Politics in Exclusion Era Photographs, and From the Gold Rush to the Earthquake. Our galleries at 678 Mission Street are open Wednesday through Saturday, so please visit. There are some quick housekeeping matters that we need to attend to before we move on to our program. First, I need to tell you that this program is being recorded and that the video will be available for viewing on our YouTube channel or on the PATH programs page of our website in the next few days. We are delighted to be presenting this program live and we will be taking questions at the end. So please use the Q&A feature, which is at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. For any comments or conversations, please use the chat box, also located at the bottom of your screen. We're thrilled to see so many of you here this evening. Um, it lets us know that you're interested in our programs and we wanted to continue bringing you this kinds of programming, but we need your help to do so. So in a few moments, we're going to launch a brief poll and we invite you to answer a few questions. Your participation helps us access important grant funding for programs like this one. This is completely voluntary and anonymous and the results will not be shared with the audience. I really encourage you to participate. It's just a few multiple choice questions and you'll have about two minutes to answer them. Uh, be sure to hit the submit button at the end of the poll. Okay, we're going to launch the poll now. Here we go. All right, thank you very much for participating. And now I'd like to introduce you all to Tanya Hollis, who will then introduce us to our speaker for the evening, Rachel Schreiber. Tanya Hollis is a San Francisco-based archivist and artist. Since 2011, she has worked in a number of positions supporting the Labor Archives and Research Center at San Francisco State University, and is currently serving as the interim director. Prior to her position at the Labor Archives, Tanya held archivist positions at the California Historical Society and the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley. Tanya, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's so wonderful to have you, and I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, and thank you all for joining us. It is such a pleasure to be here together celebrating the life of Elaine Black Uneda one of our heroes at the Labor Archives, and to welcome Rachel Schreiber, a historian of gender and labor activism and an artist and designer back to the Bay Area. Welcome back, Rachel. Rachel has published widely on topics related to women, labor, and activism, including three books and numerous peer-reviewed essays. She's also exhibited artworks on these topics, including in Labor Fest in previous years, when Rachel lived in the San Francisco Bay Area for 12 years prior to relocating to New York City. She's currently concluding a three-year term as Executive Dean of Parsons School of Design at the, new, at the New School, where she is also University Professor. Please help me welcome Rachel Schreiber. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you so much. It's really great to be here. Um, 
I only, I wish I was in person at the California Historical Society, but then again, Zoom allows for a different kind of audience. Um, but um, I've, I've been doing a handful of book events, but I have to say this one is um, extra special and near to my heart because I really uh, began the research for this book in um, at the California Historical Society and at SF State Labor Archives. So it's, um, this is kind of like a, like a return home. And there are so many people in the Bay Area who helped um, helped me along the way and contribute to the success, many scholars and archivists and librarians and friends. So um, through the oddness of Zoom webinar, I, I can't see you if you're here, but I, I hope some of you are and I'm, and I'm sending you uh, greetings from, from New York City. Um, so I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna just speak for a pretty short while about um, Elaine Black Yoneda and about the book. And then um, Tanya is going to rejoin, and we're going to we're going to treat this conversationally so that it'll be um, a little less a little less formal um, than just you know I, I didn't want to just um, talk talk to you and, and talk at you um, for the entire time. But maybe we could begin with some slides, and I'll just uh, I'll just I thought I'd share a few images and then read a little bit from from the book. Um, so the first slide is just um, is a cover of the book. Um, and it was designed um, by a Bay Area graphic designer, actually, Lucille Tanazas, who also is a Parsons faculty member. She splits her time between, um, between San Francisco and New York City. Oh, I think we might be, are we getting our slides going? There we go, okay. So, um, so this is a cover of the book, and and um, you'll see these. You'll see a couple of these images um, reappear in the next few slides. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how I came to the subject because people that that's a question people ask me <clears throat> all the time. And um, so, what happened was in two thousand nine, I was commissioned by the Contemporary Jewish Museum just down the street from the California Historical Society to, to do a project about. Um, for, for their exhibition, California Dreaming, which was a, a kind of history of Jewish Californians um, throughout the, the, you know, throughout California history. And um, I was asked to do a, a body of work that would highlight lesser known Jewish Californians. And in that research for that project, I came across in a book by um, Fred Rosenbaum called Cosmopolitans, just a few sentences about Elaine. And I became immediately intrigued um, by a couple of things. One, that she was a Jewish woman um, who lived, who spent time in a concentration camp in California during World War II. And I'll, I'll talk a lot more about that in a bit. <clears throat> and also that she was um, an important person in 1930s California labor history and that she distributed um, pamphlets at the 1934 general strike um, called pamphlets that were titled What to Do When Under Arrest. Those are the first two things I learned about Elaine. And as part of the project for the California, uh, for the Contemporary Jewish Museum, I traveled to Manzanar. Maybe some of you have been there. And I'll take the next slide, please. Um, and they have a robust um, visitor center and was able to find the record of um, Elaine and Carl and Tommy. There you see kind of in the middle of their time having been there. Um, and I photographed the site. Um, I'll take the next slide, please. Um, and this was the ensuing body of work. It was um, a series of photographs, each with text. And they had um, the images, I think of them as portraits, but they're actually landscapes. But they, um, they each, each text, each piece is about a different person. And so a lot of this, this project, and even a lot of Elaine's story, is really a California story, and hence the title of this event. Um, because Elaine, <clears throat> her, her, late, her career as a labor activist really spanned the state of California, as did her life. And also because the nature and character of the work that she and others did in labor activism would be um, would be um, of a different character if it had been in, in the Northeast. So there was that as well. And um, for the take the next slide, this is the photograph um, in that body of work that is representing Elaine. And this is um, block four, and um, which is the site of the apartment, I put that in quotes because I think that um, people who are at Manzanar 
incarcerated at Manzanar used its used apartments somewhat euphemistically to describe the barracks um, that they were in. Next slide, I just thought I'd share a few more images that I thought would be of interest, particularly to this audience. Um, this is a, a newspaper article, Radical Fails as Own Attorney. Um, Elaine was, was a real natural born speaker and did often defend herself and others in court, but I guess uh, this time she didn't prevail. Communist woman found guilty here. So this, this gives you not only a picture of her, there she is in the middle of the photograph, but also a kind of sense of the language that was used to describe her in, in the press at the time. Next slide is, I believe, uh, a photograph of Elaine and her husband, Carl Yoneda, and their son, Tom Yoneda, at Manzanar. Um, so part of the story here, which, which um, I'll read, you know, we'll, we'll talk more about, is that Carl um, and Tommy were incarcerated at Manzanar when they were sent to Manzanar um, Elaine insisted on accompanying them. The, the story is a little more complicated than that because Carl actually initially went as a volunteer. He thought that um, he was misled to believe that he would have a paying job there. And he realized pretty much upon his arrival that he was um, in, you know, in, incarcerated. Um, and shortly after he arrived, the notice came that, he, that even their three-year-old son would have to report to Manzanar and Elaine just insisted on accompanying them. And another, another whole aspect of this story, <clears throat> which really makes it a California story, is that the Owens Valley, where Manzanar is located, um, is, if you know the movie Chinatown, you know that the story of how that valley became desertified was about the diversion of water from that valley to Los Angeles. And so Tommy, who had asthma, even at, at that young age, it was just, <clears throat> it was a terrible situation for him. And, and it's hard to see, but there's a sign on, the, on their apartment that says Tommy's dust out in, which was the way that the Unitas were trying to keep their young son entertained and make it seem like a kind of Wild West um, fun situation when in fact um, they were trying to keep the dust out of their um, space as best they could. Next image. Eventually, Carl um, enlisted in the US Army, which is a whole other interesting part of the story. And um, he, here he is at Fort Snelling in Minnesota for basic training and during a time when Elaine and uh, Tommy were able to come visit him. So that's actually what led to Carl leaving the camp was um, his enlistment in the Army and his transfer to Minnesota. Um, and here they are together on a visit. Next slide, please. And then, you know, I, I think there are probably many people here who knew both uh, Carl and Elaine or, or one or the other. <coughs> it's an interesting fact about writing about a subject who, who's been alive recently. Um, she died in 1988. And so I thought I'd include this photo, which might be how people remember them in more recent years. And then just one final photo. I had the very good fortune, <coughs> excuse me, next slide, please. I had the very good fortune to spend a day with Tom Yoneda and hear from him about his mother's story. Um, Tom passed away in January of, of this year, this year or last year. Now I'm getting, COVID time has us all confused about time, but I spent a day with him in, um, in Pengrove in um, 2019, in, the, in early 2019. And he was really generous in sharing stories with me about his mother. And I really um, also want to shout out to Ken Khan, who through, it was through Ken that I got in touch with Tommy after a long search for him. Okay, so we can turn off the screen share. And I am going to read <coughs> just really a few paragraphs, um, first from the introduction and then from a bit later in the book. This is actually the opening of the introduction. Elaine Black Yoneda, Jewish immigration, labor activism, and Japanese American exclusion and incarceration is a biography of Elaine Black Yoneda, 1906 to 1988, communist labor activist and daughter of Russian Jewish immigrants who spent eight months during World War II living in a concentration camp, not in Europe, but in California. 
Elaine's path to the Manzanar War Relocation Center wends through a multi-generational history of labor activism, commencing in Russia, continuing on the East Coast of the United States and culminating in California, where Elaine and her family became involved with the racially and ethnically diverse radical community of Los Angeles. It was there that Elaine met the love of her life, Japanese American communist organizer, Carl Yoneda. When Carl and their three-year-old son, Tommy, were required to go to Manzanar, Elaine insisted on accompanying them. Sadly, the xenophobic fervor that swept the United States after the bombing of Pearl Harbor has recently emerged yet again in this country, rendering Elaine's story prescient of current events. The anti-Asian discrimination and violence that proliferated alongside the COVID-19 pandemic is yet another instance in our history of the construction of a racial panic. The early and erroneous ascribing of the spread of the virus to travelers from China only confirmed this society's all too easy willingness to blame a racialized other for its own inability to adequately respond to a crisis. But perhaps the most poignant and uncanny example that relates to Elaine's story was the recent repurposing of a military base in Oklahoma that had been used to incarcerate Japanese Americans during World War II to detain Latin American children separated from their families at the border. The contemporary relevance of such topics reminds us of our historic and contemporary anti-immigrant rhetoric, laws, and policies. Studying the history of Japanese American exclusion and incarceration is critical for a full understanding of the dangers posed by such actions. The fact that a Jewish woman spent time in a concentration camp on US soil during World War II exposes the profound contradictions of the rhetorics employed to express the necessity of incarcerating Japanese Americans precisely in order to fight a very analogous system of racial classification in Europe. Here, she volunteered to go. There, she would have had no choice. There, she would have been included in a racialized group that the state asserted was a threat to the future of that society. Here, her husband and son were thus assigned while she was not. Indeed, the circumstances that had pushed her parents from Russia were due to their need to escape violence based on, the very on that very identity, while the pull to this country was based on the promise of a society free from such persecution. Here, Elaine clearly enjoyed a sense of privilege, which must be emphasized by virtue of the construction of Jewishness as whiteness. And yet that construction was only at this point in time, a recent phenomenon in US history. Upon their arrival in New York City, her parents, as Russian Jewish working class immigrants, would have been very much understood to be not white, but as scholar Karen Brodkin has demonstrated, through distinctly US processes of race making, this would shift by mid-century. Okay, I'm gonna skip ahead and just read a little bit from the section where, um, um, that we get to where um, Elaine and Carl first learn of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Elaine and Carla woke on a Sunday morning, December 7th, 1941, to clear skies and warm sunshine. They made a plan to bring the children to Golden Gate Park after completing some chores. Elaine took care of some laundry. Carl's was, Carl was outside washing their new Studebaker. Joyce was doing housework and little Tommy was underfoot. Suddenly the radio show Elaine was listening to was interrupted by an emergency announcement. This morning at 7.55 a.m. Hawaii time, Japanese warplanes began attacking Pearl Harbor. Many U.S. warships are damaged with heavy casualties. Elaine yelled for Carl to come inside and immediately hear the shocking news. Carl and his colleagues at Doho, the Los Angeles-based Japanese language progressive paper he worked with at the time, had been discussing for some time the probability that Japan would enter the war but they did not anticipate that it would come in the form of a Japanese attack on Hawaii. Elaine and Carl looked at one another and wondered, how will this affect the Japanese American community 
There had been rumors for months that an evacuation of Japanese Americans was possible. But what would evacuation mean? Where might they be sent? Carl said he would go to the center of Japantown and find out what he could. Elaine stayed at home to watch the children. What Carl immediately witnessed was confusion and conflicting responses. Passing by the Goshado bookstore at Post and Buchanan Streets, Carl overheard some Issei gleefully praising Japan's actions, shouting, hurrah for the Imperial J Japanese Army, and the Imperial Japanese Army will sail into the Golden Gate soon. Disgusted by this support for the army from which he had escaped conscription, Carl continued and came upon a reporter asking two Nisei members of the US Army in uniform if they were ready to fight Japan. Of course, the GIs replied. Meanwhile, the proprietor of a, Jap of a Japan town hotel, Ichiro Kataoka, was being arrested and taken away by FBI agents. The arrests appeared to be random, with many innocent people being accused of being enemy aliens. Nisei stood around in clusters, whispering to one another, worried about what would happen to their parents who were not citizens. Would they be deported? The scene was one of mayhem and much fear. So I will, um, I will stop there and let you all read on from there, hopefully, um, in the book itself. And um, I think we'll shift to some questions with from Tanya. Thank you. Um, actually, I, one of my questions I had later was about um, the actual word of internment. So I thought maybe I'd just ask that now since it's so sure. um, related to what you just read. Um, the use of the term internment has a very contentious history. And in more recent years, there's been a more full embrace of the use of incarceration rather than internment. And the designation of the camps is concentration camps rather than internment camps. Uh, maybe you could share with the audience just how that progression has happened um, and where we are right now in that, in that transition, because I know it's been a very long transition in the yeah. library community and the archives community. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm happy. I'm, thank you for the question. It's a good question. I know it comes up a lot um, when people hear me use those terms, um, especially concentration camp. Um, I've really taken my clues here from scholars um, who, who I mean, I, I'm, I am more so a, his, a, a historian of Jewish women and labor activism and Jewish women's involvement in labor activism than I am of Japanese American history. Um, Roger Daniels in particular has written about this topic and the use of the terminology. And he makes the case, um, to begin with the concept of internment, that internment is a, um, it has a very particular meaning in US policy and law. And it applies to, um, it applies to the, um, to the detained to, to people being detained who are not um, US citizens. So for one thing, um, the use of internment is just legally wrong because most of the Japanese Americans who were incarcerated were American citizens. And I make the point in the book that even some of those who were not because they were of the older generation um, would have been American citizens if it weren't for the anti immigrant and kind of xenophobic yeah. laws that barred them from Im immigrant, I mean, from citizenship status. <clears throat> so that's, that's just to say a little bit about internment. Um, and as far as concentration camp, the thing I do want to start by saying is I know that it's provocative. Um, I know it's particularly provocative for a Jewish woman to refer to camps in the United States as concentration camps. Um, here too, I take cues from the scholars of this history and who say that, um, I mean, scholars of Japanese American history who point out that concentration camps by their most straightforward definition were intended to concentrate a population for a particular reason. So in the most literal sense, um, these camps were concentration camps. Add to that, that scholars of the Holocaust and of the, of the war in Europe now are very clear to distinguish death camps from concentration camps, which is to say that the death camps in Europe were a subset of a, of a broader set of concentration camps, or another way to say it is that not all concentration camps were death camps. Um, so, you know, 
Elaine and Carl themselves were very aware. Um, they, they mention what was going on in Europe quite often, and they, dis they distinguish in their own words their situation at Manzanar from what was happening in, say, you know, a place like Auschwitz. Um, at the same time, um, I also, you know, I also want to point out that another um, episode in the history, which is that Elaine and Carl, after the war, did become part of the movement for redress and reparations, and also to get Manzanar I, um, designated as a national historical landmark, which it now is, and there's a really um, fascinating visitor center there, and, and I encourage people to go because it's super interesting. And they um, fought a long battle for the wording of the plaque that went up there initially, and the, there were some specific words that the U.S. government opposed in the in their proposed language, including concentration camp. And they finally did convince the U.S. government to allow them to use concentration camp. So, and yet another reason why why that matters to me is because it honors that that effort and that history. Um, and then I just want to make one final um, point about this, which is really, I think, maybe the most interesting, which is that to me, I should say maybe it was just most interesting to me and, and surprising to me, which is that the camps were referred to as concentration camps in the United States until the Allied forces liberated the camps in Europe. And then there was a very deliberate move on the part of the U.S. government to avoid the use of concentration camp to speak about the camps in the United States. So for, the reason that's so important to me is because that to me gets at the heart of what I was reading in the introduction, which is that there was, it, it, there was a lot of hypocrisy here, that a lot of um, the, what the US government was saying, we, are, we need to fight um, Hitler in Europe because of this um, racism, because of genocide and, and I don't, you know, genocide was very deliberate and happening there, and that's not what was happening here exactly. Um, but we were violating the civil rights of our own citizenship in the name of that, using the same kind of system of classification. And the fact that our own government knew that that they wanted to, not, they wanted to distance themselves from that usage, um, to me reveals just the, the fact that there, there were, um, the fact of that hypocrisy, I guess I'll say. I do. I mean, I I was amazed a little bit to read that um, Carl and Elaine actually didn't protest the civil rights violation of being sent. Um, and I find that really contradictory in some sense. And then, it, you know, it also makes perfect sense in the sense that they were very much advocating for a position of being pro-American as Americans. Um, and, and I'm wondering, you know, how much of that is, is something that became part of their story. Um, it, it definitely changes the course of their trajectory when they're in the camp and I won't ruin things for people um, who haven't read the book yet, but it is, it is a very um, kind of red, red flag in, in the story where they decide to be very much on the side of the administrators of the camp and, and are very pro, um, even the camp itself, they, they believe that there's a justification for doing it. Um, and I find that really interesting and conflicting with what we know about Elaine in her early years. Um, but I'm gonna turn maybe a little bit to that. I have a few more questions. We have so many questions coming in too um, <laughs> in the chat, which is amazing. Um, I do want to just answer one question. Uh, people are asking if if she had more than one child. She did have another child named Joyce um, from a different marriage. Yes. So that that was that was mm -hmm. a prior prior marriage. Um, mm. So Joyce was much older than Tommy. Um, but I want to turn a little bit more toward your you know, wheelhouse, which is women's history and labor history. And just ask like, you know, um, women's voices are just sometimes completely hidden and or sublimated in archives in general and in the historical record. Um, so what are the challenges for finding those stories in archives um, as an archivist? I'm interested in knowing this because I think there's been a lot of work done. Um, one of my predecessors, <clears throat> Lynn Bonfield, who worked both at CHS and the Labor Archives made a very concerted effort in the 70s to start collecting women's voices 
in particular people like Elaine. Um, so doing oral history projects and um, trying to get those records before people died. So I do want to say that there's been an effort, but it's still difficult to find these, these women's stories, um, often even in the naming um, where they go by their husband's name, the Mrs. John Doe or whatever they are. Um, so what strategies did you use to find more about Elaine? Elaine was very much front and center telling her own <clears throat> story. So you had to sort of also take that into account. But um, I found it very interesting that you, you went to Tom in particular to sort of answer part of that, that story to fill some of the absences. So I'm just wondering what your other strategies were. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, uh, I completely agree with you. It, it takes, it, I, I, I always say it takes a different kind of looking to find, uh, to find women's stories in the archives. Um, and another thing that I um, often say is that there's um, a lot of privilege to appearing in an archive, right? Which is to say that, um, you know, we, famous um, figures of dominant identities, white men and otherwise, might have copious wealthy people have copious archives and the other elaine had a few things um, going against her her historical record not only that she was a woman but also being working class means that you move a lot and who knows what we will never know what documents and papers were lost right um the the fact that we have as much as we do is actually impressive the papers at sf state were definitely um key to my work, as were um, the oral histories that you mentioned. There's two major oral histories that were conducted with Elaine, one by the California Historical Society and Bancroft Library, which maybe Tanya, you know more about, you might know more about the origin stories there than I do. And the other, um, as part of a, um, another really important oral history project um, initiated by Arthur Hansen at Cal State Fullerton, um, recording the stories of people who've been incarcerated. So being a woman, being working class, having been incarcerated, which also meant that, you know, they, had, Carl and Elaine distributed a bunch of their belongings among a whole group of friends when they um, went to first, Elaine went to Los Angeles to her parents before Manzanar, and, and we don't know what's there. Um, Carl's papers are at University of California, Los Angeles. They're definitely, um, that's definitely a far more extensive archive than SF State, um, I mean, then Elaine's papers, not, not because they're at SF State, but, you know, I, I even think the fact that, that, that he is a man and that he had far more speaking engagements after the war and so forth meant that <clears throat> he had a more extensive record. Uh, to be fair, he was also an editor and a writer. So editors and writers tend to have more um, copious records. Um, but I guess what I want to focus on too is that um, I've been I, I think a lot about feminist biography in particular, and I've taken, you know, there are some, there are some really important models of um, amazing books by women uh, biographers that learn to look differently at archives. I mean, maybe the most famous of those is Martha Ballard's um, A Midwife's Tale, where this um, very laconic diary um, that we have um, by a woman who is a midwife um, in, you know, in 17th century um, North America that for many generations, it was never, it, it was not like hidden and suddenly discovered, but it was that score, um, generations of male historians didn't deem it worthy, didn't think it was important or interesting. As I said, it's laconic. It states the, you know, very um, short entries about the children she birthed uh, as a midwife, but um, Martha, um, the author is able to um, turn it into a, an incredible tale about a woman who defies many of our expectations about what a woman in that time would, would mean. So um, there are some points in the book where I read photographs very carefully and closely in order to learn what I can about um, their story. Um, there are instances where, you know, we have to read um, differently and read between the lines and piece things together. And also, you know, as I, I, I don't, I think that um, part of the job of being a historian is to, is to interpret, right? It's not a mere kind of scribing of facts. So there might, you know, it means a different kind of level of interpretation sometimes. 
Um, yeah, so and those, are, those are some thoughts. Um, there's one related question in the chat that I'm just going to bring to the forefront, which is um, Robert Turney. Uh, he's just he know he notes that Elaine had many oral histories um, available to us and interviews. Um, what and he asked, what did you find in comparing her oral history with the archival sources? Which is um, an interesting thing because I I um, was talking with Jessica as well about sort of the mythology of Elaine um, that Elaine mm -hmm. perhaps contributed to creating um, through her own framing of her history. So I'm curious, like you know, how did how did you un uncover the real Elaine? Yeah, <laughs> under all these different layers of presentation, either you know, also through the newspapers. Obviously, they had a very romantic idea of her even when they were calling her a communist they know her clothing and her demeanor and all these other things um so they had romanticized her as well so it's it's just an interesting mm -hmm. question yeah and and that's another i mean certainly that's another part of a job of a historian is to have a critical eye towards the archive i mean it, it's 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 clear with some subjects, and I would say Elaine is one of them, and I always felt this was true about the um, her archive at SF State, that um, it's an archive of her own fashioning, to your point. So she's she 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 is keeping papers and collecting papers and including typescripts and letters that tell the story in a certain way. And and that's I mean that's not unusual. That's what you know it, I think it's rare unless say, you know, a subject um, passed passes away suddenly early in life, when someone later in life is starting to think about how they will be remembered, they shape their archives. So that's not, you know, that's not totally um, unusual. I think the thing, the thing I would highlight, Tanya, is that um, the, the, the part of the story that I was most um, curious about in a certain way, and this, this gets back to something you had said earlier, part of the story I was most curious about is how and 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 I know that readers and 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 people who come to these book events that I've been doing often are stymied by the same question: How is it possible that the two of them did not oppose exclusion and incarceration? <clears throat> and so, one of the things I looked really carefully throughout both of uh, Carl and Elaine's papers was some indication of regret later in their lives after the war, because they did join the movement. For redress and reparations, and um, and they do. It's not often, and it's not a lot. But there are the moments when they say, "We were wrong. We were wrong to acquiesce and give up our civil rights and support this." Um, similarly, their both of their accounts, both Carl and Elaine, um, their accounts of their time at Manzanar, um, they refer in a very cut and dried kind of way to those at the camp who were pro-Japanese. And I, I, I have a more critical view in the sense that, um, and again, this follows the work of other scholars on, the, on this history, but that there were those at the camp who were resisting. I, would, I call them resistors. They were enacting in a resistance to their own incarceration. Elaine and Carl saw them as, um, as pro-Japanese, that they were, uh, this is part of the story about why they were not so opposed um, to the, and in fact supported the idea of exclusion because they believed there were pro-Japanese elements. These are words, these are quotes because these are words that they used in, in that who could be disloyal to the United States. And those are, those are not the ways I would characterize people who are resisting just as I think if, I think if I put it in a contemporary frame, many people will relate to the fact that like, I'm a US citizen. I don't support everything that the US government does. You know, does that make me anti-American? These kind, you know, these kinds of For questions. Sure. So I think it was so, just more interesting to me because uh, in her prior work with ILD, she had actually worked closely with the ACLU and the ACLU Northern California chapter in particular, which was involved in the Korematsu case. Um, so it is, it is sort of interesting that they must have known maybe that that was happening that but still sort of felt that they were on and I, it also seemed like there was um and i again i won't ruin the story but that 
having that level of violence within the camp probably also isolated them in a way that that made it worthwhile for them to really try to build alliances rather than, um, you know, to save their family. I mean, you do also interesting things when your family's under threat um, and direct threat that way. Um, I, yeah, I mean, add, I have, I'm sorry, I have lots of other questions, but I'm like, there are many <laughs> questions in the chat. So we can wrap this question up and then maybe um, I'll move to see who else wants to, um, bring some questions up to sure. us. There's so much, there's tons, there's tons more to say. I, I can't, I'm not following the chat while I'm, I'm focusing, but there's That's definitely- That's probably for the um, best because you'd be um, <laughs> going like, like I I'll am. I'll look forward to saving and reading it afterwards. But, I do um, just one- I guess, one I guess I just, let me say this one thing, Tanya, which is that, you know, it, part of the reason I chose that beginning of that section about the bombing of Pearl Harbor to read is because what, it, what I think is important to convey is what kind of sense of chaos there was yeah, like after the bombing sure. of Pearl Harbor. And in chaotic moments and moments of crisis, people make all kinds of decisions that they might not in a, in a different time. Um, and that um, on the one hand, um, it's not necessarily a surprise as soon as you say it that the Japanese American community is not monolithic and there were many political viewpoints and, and other you know, perspectives within that community that, that followed that group of people into camps. Um, and, and at the same time, there were some strange bedfellows. I mean, the, the Unidas became um, close at Manzanar with people who were part of the Japanese American Citizens League, even while they had been protesting some of those members' business practices, you know, and labor practices before incarceration. So it was very, com it's very complicated. I, I, I don't sure. want to think like this. <laughs> I don't want to simplify very it either. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But I do want to first just say, um, as Francis brings up, that this oral history is being digitized so you all can read the, the oral history yourselves. Um, but I also want to turn it over a little bit to Jessica. Jessica has um, been moderating your questions and we'll have a few to bring to Rachel's attention. Thank you, Tanya, and thank you, Rachel. It's just been such a rich um, and interesting conversation so far, so I definitely don't want to stop the momentum here. We do have a lot of wonderful questions coming in, and thank you all so much for um, your enthusiasm about the topic and um, wonderful questions. So um, there's a few questions um, that are related to about how many Japanese women um, so non-Japanese women who went to the camps with their spouses and what did the other Japanese women think of those women the non-Japanese women and specifically Jewish women? <clears throat> yeah that um there is uh there was a significant and not there was not a not insignificant there were there were definitely non-Japanese Americans in the camps um and the majority of them were spouses of um of people who were incarcerated, of Japanese Americans. And there was a very bizarre um, gender logic. <laughs> I think, it, well, I, you know, there was a lot that was bizarre. There was very bizarre gender logic, which said that um, the, a child of a, of a Japanese American, I have to make sure I say this correctly. The child, if a child's parents, one was Japanese American and one was not, if the mother was Japanese American and the father was white, they were more likely to stay out of the camp. So they were assuming that it was the father's influence that was more likely to, um, to take hold, I guess. Um, there was a mixed marriage leave policy developed a little later after Carl and Elaine had left Manzanar. Um, it wouldn't have, by my estimation, applied to them anyway because it only applied, there was a there was a there was a newer policy by which um, non Japanese Americans could leave camps. One of the criteria uh, criteria was you couldn't have an FBI record, so Elaine wouldn't have qualified anyway. And also, she she volunteered to go, so she didn't um, she wasn't required to go. By what I can tell, and there's there's not a there's not a lot. I hope that historians write more about this. There is uh, one really good um, article that I found about this um, 
whole topic. Um, but from what I've learned and understood, the vast, and this won't be surprising, I don't think, the vast majority of non-Japanese Americans who were in camps were also not white. So they might be Filipino American, they might be Latinx, they might be immigrants um, from Asia, most often from Asia, sometimes from um, South America, Latin America. Um, so I, I really don't know if there was another Jewish American um, in a camp. Um, there may have been, it may not have been, I don't, you know, they're not, the records aren't perfect on this. Um, so it, I'm sure that the responses and to the presence of, of these individuals vary. Um, Elaine was suspect for a whole bunch of reasons. She was suspect because she was a communist. She was suspect because she was cooperating. She and Carl were cooperating with authorities. She was working in the camouflage netting factory that was um, opened at Manzanar. And there was another group of people who said, why are you contributing, who were angry at anyone, at all the people who are working um, in the netting factory saying, why are you supporting the US war effort? And finally, uh, you know, I'll say one other thing, which is that um, <clears throat> for most Japanese Americans in the camps, everyone else in their communities were in the camps. Whereas Elaine had a family, a white family, you know, I want to emphasize a privileged family living in Los Angeles. And that meant that they could come to camp, which they did quite often and brought them the Unitas, you know, a stove or special food for Tommy or extra blankets. And so that was also probably put them into, um, you know, into, put them all contributed to the suspicions against them. It was like, oh, okay. So there, you know, there's a white woman living with that family, so they get special treatment and they get to have special things, right? Oh, that's so, it's so interesting just to hear, I mean, she um, did this on her own accord and joined her family and, and went through that um, with them. And it's so remarkable to hear her story and just to know that there may have been others who did the same thing. Um, other questions that have came in, were Japanese Americans a significant element in the Communist Party or in the labor activism more generally? Yes, definitely in California. Um, there were, you know, and as I said, the, the character of labor activism in California in particular, and, and certainly in Los Angeles where Elaine and Carl grew up, was that there was um, a lot of interracial and interethnic organizing, which you don't see so much in the Northeast, but there was a significant portion of the Japanese American community who were communists and labor activists. Um, and they, um, they, you know, going back to this question of, of opposing or not opposing exclusion and incarceration, I, I can say this generalization, and this was definitely true of Carl and Elaine, they were so intently anti-fascist because they were communists, that that is part of where their opposition, um, sorry, their cooperation with the US government came from because they believed in the urgent need to fight, um, to fight the, for, you know, the allied position in the war. Um, at the start of, shortly after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, I didn't quite get to it in, the, in my reading, the Communist Party actually um, kicked out the Japanese American members. And um, they, after the war, they apologized for that, but that was, that was a very hurtful moment, I think, for Carl. It was it really cut deep for him because he he and, and he and his friends said, we don't care if we're being kicked out of the party, we still think of ourselves as communists and we always will. Um, there's some questions about Carl as well. I know the book's not particularly about Carl, but there was some curiosity around how he joined the military um, while they were still in the concentration camp or directly after and how yeah. that was allowed. Um, you know, from his heritage and from being in Manzanar, do you, can you comment on that? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, it's fascinating. And there, there are a number, there's a, um, he was among a number of Japanese Americans who insisted on uh, enlisting. Carl wanted to enlist in the U.S. Army even before he arrived at Manzanar. And from the moment, actually, after Pearl Harbor was bombed, he was, he started to try to enlist in the U.S. Army. And he continued that effort at Manzanar. And eventually did um, the, I mean, let me zoom out and say this also, Car Carl and Elaine and their circle, their belief was that, um, that there were those Japanese Americans who were patriots and US patriots, and he included himself among that and he wanted to fight for the US Army in the war. 
And they also believed there were those who were, um, you know, again, pro-Japanese and disloyal to the United States. And they felt like those should be separated. And indeed the loyalty oath comes into play, but a little later after um, Carl has left uh, camp anyway. So um, he and a number of people tried to convince the um, army to come recruit at camp and they finally did. And they accepted a small number of men to join the army. There's, a, I think, a probably more well-known um, troop of Japanese Americans who went to the European um, front and fought there. Carl actually um, was sent to uh, Burma, where he, he had excellent Japanese language skills and he had been an editor. And I mean, to me, this it just becomes even more and more bizarre because he actually joins the military intelligence service and he's writing pro-US propaganda in Japanese to literally be dropped behind enemy lines. So he's a communist and a Japanese American in the MIS under surveillance. He is still under FBI surveillance even while he is in US Army uniform, right? So um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very, I mean, I guess the US government really needed Japanese translators, you know, and here was here he was eager to um, eager to help out, but, um, and, and just to even make it a little more complicated, um, his mother's living in Hir Hiroshima and she's there at the time of the bombing and he's in US army uniform in Burma and doesn't, isn't able to find out for three months or so that his mother actually survived. So it's just, it's, it, it the whole story just, I think defies continues to defy expectations on so many different levels. And that was partly what fascinated me about it. In the, in the chat, it was also brought up that that was actually the CP party line to support the effort. So I think yeah. um, even that sort of points to their loyalty to the party, despite being um, you know, banned from the party from participating. Mm -hmm. um, are there other, I see so many questions, but I'm wondering, is there any direction that you'd like to go to um, rather than having us just keep barraging you with questions? Is there something <laughs> that you haven't yet gotten to speak to? Um, I do have a lot of questions just about domestic um, life and how you mm -hmm. actually highlight that. And I found it so refreshing because in so many histories and biographies, many of them about men, we hear absolutely nothing about their home life. Um, and in her case, it, it had a huge impact on her, um, not just her role as a mother, but also her homemaking, that she had to keep making a home over and over again and often found herself unable to find a home um, and having to make decisions, especially when she and Carl were unable to find home, um, any housing to live together in right. because of um, the racism of the time. So I'm just curious, um, was how did that decision sort of arise and um, how did you find that kind of day-to-day -day material to sort of weave in that actually gave it such a beautiful texture as a real story? Um, and I, I appreciate it. I just kind of wanted to ask that question. Yeah, yeah, thanks for asking that. Um, I mean, I think, it, I think my attentiveness to that partly comes from, as I said, I'm interested in this concept of feminist biography. And we might, <coughs> excuse me, we might um, remember the old, good old feminist adage, the personal is political. So <coughs> I'm in part making the case for the fact that Elaine's story is about, is about, is much about all of these things, how she negotiated being a mother and being a, a partner um, as they are how she um, pursued her career. What's interesting is that here too, she defies expectations because um, initially she marries a man named Ed Russell. They have a daughter, Joyce. That marriage um, does not, is not sustained, it, it falls apart. And he, um, and, and she around that time starts becoming involved with Carl, but she also gets this opportunity to move to San Francisco from Los Angeles for a job um, for a different job with the ILD, and she jumps on it and leaves Joyce behind with her parents. Joyce, Joyce 
spends far more of her adult of her childhood and adolescence with Elaine's parents than she ever does with Elaine. And I, I just found that kind of unusual for a woman in the 1930s. Um, or, or, or maybe what I'd rather say is it defies our stereotypes and expectations for a woman in the 1930s to put her career in a job, you know, in front of one of the children that she already has. Um, she and Carl, as, as you mentioned, Tanya, faced a lot of um, discrimination in trying to obtain housing in San Francisco, and that was true both before World War II and after. Um, she was not, though, Elaine, on the other hand, was not, she, she was not a homemaker. She didn't like to cook. Her mother was a really good cook. She talks about that a lot. Um, and her mother <clears throat> sewed clothes for her and imbued in Elaine a love of fashion, but Elaine did not sew herself. So she was in many ways more of a, of a career person. Um, but um, a lot of, I think here I wanna give a shout out to the oral history that was done um, for, the, for this history of women in California project, because a, a lot of really um, incredible detail is in that um, oral history that we normally never get about women. I mean, she, Elaine had two abortions and the, um, the, the interviewer of that oral history really keeps bringing her back to women's topics of importance to women's history. Talks about like, how did, how, how did that happen? And how did you learn about contraception? And did your mother teach you? And, and that to me was so refreshing because often yeah. we just don't have, especially you if never get era, that we wouldn't have, <laughs> right. We never get that story. So I, yeah. I was fortunate to have, to have some access to that, but I also, um, yeah, it felt very important to me to show how she's constantly, um, kind of negotiating, um, her, her fam I, family life. And, and I think it's really <clears throat> part of what's at the core of her and Carl's love story is that whereas Ed, <clears throat> Elaine's first husband, Ed, had very traditional gender expectations of her, even as they were both becoming politicized and joining the labor movement, Ed, Ed storms in one day while she's having an ILD meeting at home and says, iron my shirt. And she's like, I'm not gonna iron your shirt. I'm busy, you iron your shirt. And she's like, you taught me how to iron. I didn't know I thought that iron before such I married a great you. story. <laughs> I also um, found it interesting, it, yeah, that you mentioned that Carl actually did a lot of the housework yeah. in the camp. Um, in particular, yes. people noted that and it, was, it caused some friction. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, and that's yet another, just sorry, that was when I left the detail left out. Yet another reason why she was, um, you know, looked down upon it while well, they were looked down upon in the camp by some more traditional um, families was because Carl would watch Tommy or do the laundry while Elaine was working. So, yeah, so that's where I was headed is that I think part of, um, part of the, the story to Elaine and Carl having such a, you know, deep and long marriage, I'll say love affair, because they were so, they just seemed to be so deeply in love with one another is that they brought, they both brought to the marriage a much more egalitarian sense of, of what their roles were than she had had. Um, in her first marriage. We have a, quite a few questions coming in the chat. Should we jump back over to get some more questions from the audience? Um, there was a couple questions that came in um, about the work that, that um, she continued to do after Manzanar. Can you talk a little bit about what Elaine did after Manzanar? Yeah, sure. Um, well, Initially, um, when, when Carl first gets out of uh, the army and the family's reunited in San Francisco, but Carl has trouble finding work, where he does find work as a longshoreman, but based on um, his physical state at that point, after having been incarcerated, after having been in the army, he finds he's really unable to do the work. Um, Elaine's parents convince them and, and help them, in fact, buy a chicken ranch in um, in Sonoma County, which, you know, that is yet a whole other interesting history. Um, I, I see a little scrolling by in the chat that I think some people are familiar with, but um, fascinating history of Yiddish speaking Zionist, uh, socialist and communist chicken ranchers in Sonoma County. There's actually was similarly um, some of those chicken farms in New Jersey. I know some people 
here in New York, whose parents um, or family members were involved in that. Um, also a significant Japanese American community in Sonoma County. So um, they, they spend a, a, a stretch of time living up there. In fact, they, they live there until Tommy graduates from high school to try to give him some stability too, because turns out they didn't like chicken ranching a whole lot. And it was not so easy when Carl, Elaine's parents had, had friends who were part of that community. And they were like, yeah, you know, budget by ranch, you know, you just have to raise some chickens. And they were like, this is no, you know, longshoreman work, I'm sure is very physically demanding, but I think chicken ranching sounds pretty physically demanding as well as being um, hot and smelly. Um, and they didn't know what they were doing at first either, so it took them a, a while to learn. And then they, they do move back to um, San Francisco and, and the Bay Area, and she does um, get very active with the ILWU, with the Auxiliary and others. Um, I think there are people probably here in the audience who knew them during that latter period who might know, um, you know, might know more about that um, and can contribute to that knowledge. Um, but um, they were, you know, they were they were active in these um, causes throughout their life, and and as I said, they were active in um, they became very active in the campaign for redress and reparations, and they testified um, about their experiences at Manzanar. One of the one of the um, one of the best primary source documents is Elaine's testimony um, in that campaign for redress and reparations, where she recounts her experience at Manzanar. So it's her, it's, ret it's retrospective. So that's another, yet another time as a historian when you have to be, um, have someone of a critical eye to say, this is someone remembering something from a different point in their life. But it, it is, I think, a really important document. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what you learned about her parents? I know you probably don't want to give too much away about the book. I know her parents had a quite a remarkable story um, and maybe some of the, the source materials that they came from. Yeah, um, yeah, there's not a whole lot about her parents outside of what she, you know, her own telling. Um, her parents, in some ways, were very typical of Jewish immigrants to the United States from Russia. Um, they were childhood sweethearts. They met in a match factory um, where they were child laborers, um, and they became, union, you know, they, they, they participated in a strike very early, um, partly because of that partly because um, her father, Nathan Buchmann, would have been, um, um, was, was, would have been conscripted into the Tsar's army, which is something he very much wanted to avoid, not only because he didn't believe in, you know, that army, but also because um, Jews in that army were treated really badly. Um, they, um, Molly and Nathan, um, came first to New York City lived in various places in Brooklyn, the Lower East Side. Elaine was born at 12th and D, which is about uh, three blocks north and four blocks east of where I'm sitting right now, before they uh, moved around a bunch, then went to San Diego, and then eventually um, Los Angeles. So um, on the one hand, their story is somewhat typical of, as I said, of Jew Russian Jewish immigrants to the U.S. On the other hand, it's atypical in that um, Nathan owned a barbershop and eventually by the time they were in Los Angeles he owned a dry goods store so they were um, they were better off financially than a lot of Jewish immigrant families they were not like they were not sweatshop workers you know they were um, they were pro-labor and they were very active in the labor movement they hosted speakers at their home in Los Angeles you know Mother Bloor and others um, and, you know luminaries um, but they themselves were, um, were, were, you know, shopkeepers. So they had, a, they were in a somewhat better financial situation, um, than some of the other people in their circles. I found it so interesting in the book how, um, you mentioned that, you know, her parents had such an, um, impact on her politics later on, but originally she was quite rebellious against their ideas and, you know, and just about a rebellious teenager, maybe. Um, but it's interesting how, in the end, they really did their 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 experiences in politics really did influence her in her life as well, and came sort of together, um, you know, in the end, um, well, towards <clears throat> the end of her life. It's just really, I think it's sort of a beautiful um, how how their story really tied into her story as well, um, and they were always supportive of her too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was a rebellious teenager, which meant. Um, being uninterested in labor, labor politics and labor activism, but she, 
eventually had her own awake awakening. She came into her own class consciousness, as, as we might say, and um, they had a very close relationship. And and they were they were um, they were a bit wary at first of Carl. They were they were um, they had some um, prejudices, I'll say, against her being with um, her being part of an interracial relationship. But I, I think that they really came to love Carl and and um, moved past that um eventually um can you speak to the mention that there may be an adapt adaptation of elaine bacchionita's story in the uh, in the works for a film yeah absolutely i'd be happy to yes the book has been optioned for production as a feature film by independent producer tony amatulo so we are very hopeful that that will um come to fruition um it's just you know i, I tony is a great fan of Elaine and the story and you know in in many ways you know it's, it's it is really a love story at, at its heart in in a, in a whole lot of ways and there are just there's so many different um interesting episodes so um I think we'd we'd all love to see it come to uh come to the big screen um Tanya asked before if there's any aspect that we really weren't touching on that I that I might like to touch on it and I do and there actually there is because um, we haven't talked much about her work in the 1930s, and especially because this is an event co-hosted by Labor Fest. And shout out to Steve Zeltzer, who's been a big supporter as well of, of the book and getting the word out. You know, it, I mean, I, there, there's some, there's so much to say, but I guess I guess what I what I'll say for starters is, I was very attentive in writing the book that this episode of their life at Manzanar is very important. It is eight months out of a life. I think that though, I, you know. I would, it's easy to say that um, their incarceration changed the course of their life and everything that happened after it, it was a huge impact. But before that, you know, I, I really wanted to make sure that the, uh, her work with the ILD, her work as a labor activist in support of unionists was, got its due in the story, you know, that it doesn't get um, sidelined by this other interesting fact of her having been at Manzanar. Um, but she was really, she was a really key figure in the 1930s in West Coast uh, labor work and really throughout the state. I mean, she, she worked in San Francisco. She went to the Central Valley. She went to Eureka. She worked in Sonoma. She worked with the maritime workers. So it, the, air, the, the kinds of um, aspects of California labor history that she is involved in, her involvement in the 1934 general strike, you can almost like you can tell so much of California labor history through, uh, at least for that, you know, especially for the 1930s through, through her eyes and through what she was, what she was doing. Yeah, quite remarkable. She, she really was involved in so many important aspects of that movement. Um, it's amazing. I mean, it's no wonder they called her the Red Angel and that she was really um, sort of immortalized in some ways. I think she was so inspiring probably to a lot of women in her time as well, being very um, uh, brave, I would say. Um, it's really amazing. Tanya, did you have any other questions on your end for Rachel? No, I did have a one more i just i guess i was more curious too about her friendships because we we talked a little bit about this um when we first met um and i just wondered you know how, how did she sort of use those friendships with the other women to organize how did she uh sort of move up in what was a very um let's just say male dominated world of labor activism and organizing and how she sort of she did manage i she didn't get very high obviously you don't get to the top as a woman um but she did manage to make her way into some very important roles and i'm curious like how she leveraged her friendships to get other women involved to get other women into positions of power um, or even just to give more voice to women. It was very telling to me that the thing that brought her into the movement was the story of her seeing a woman actually being brutalized at a protest. And, and I sort of was <clears throat> like, oh, you know, I think that's a story in and of itself of how, yeah. how women were also just so involved in those protests. They, it wasn't a male dominated world on that end. Um, the union 
there, the membership was was integrated in many ways, gender wise um, and immigrant wise. So I'm I'm wondering about that, but also, um, you know, her story is so much one of the Jewish diaspora in California mm -hmm. in particular. Um, and I'm just what you know. She's of course a, a very singular figure in many ways, but but there are others that seem to have a similar trajectory, and I, I I wondered about that as well. If you wanted to just talk about that, yeah, she. Um, um, first of all, this is a story partly about the CPUSA, about the Communist Party of the United States, which made a deliberate decision in the 1930s um, with the Great Depression to shift its, um, its approach and policies in the United States. And among those shifts in policies was to embrace uh, women um, and women's potential to be part of the party and part of the leadership of the party. So um, the fact that she came along, you know, it, 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 she, she, was, she was there at the moment when that was possible in a way that it wouldn't have been at other moments in um, communist party history in the United States. And um, it's exactly as you say, Tanya, on the one hand, there were definitely um, other women like her, Jewish immigrants. Um, and, and, but then there was really a, a pretty diverse group of women. And um, I think that she really thrived on her friendships with women and she built deep connections, really deep connections with them. And, they, and, and on the one hand, there too, like her friend Ida Roth, they used, they used Yiddish um, to evade the surveillance of of the Red Squads or the FBI, um, um, and they, you know, they spoke Yiddish with one another, and, and definitely had a shared um, cultural background. They were they were secular. They were quite secular, very secular. Um, in fact, you know, Tom Tommy told me that his, his mother would never step foot in a synagogue, and his father would never step foot in a Buddhist temple. But he he was going to both later in life. That's another story. Um, so they were secular, but they were very culturally identified as Jewish, um, Elaine and other women that, that she was um, working with. Um, and at the same time, she was also able to develop friendships with women from completely different backgrounds than herself. Um, Anita Whitney was a very close friend of hers throughout her life. And Tommy has memories of playing in Anita's mansion on Knob Hill. Um, and Elaine didn't drive. And I think in, you know, she always got other people to drive her around. I mean, you know, and she covered a lot of ground, like I said, you know, from Eureka to the Imperial Valley. And, and I, I was like, kind of like to imagine that on those long car rides, um, you know, they spent a lot of time. Anita drove her a lot. Um, that was one of the uh, main roles that Anita Whitney played in, in the movement. And then you also have, um, you know, a woman like Happy Brannon from the Central Valley who um, really became politicized um, because of Elaine meeting her and, and um, helping actually to get her out of out of prison um, in relation to farm work. And they, and they they remained friends for a long time. In fact, Happy visits um, the Unitas at Manzanar and also is the one who drives Elaine and Tommy to I think Sacramento is where Carl when he. It finally leaves the army and gets back stateside and makes his way to California. He ends up in Sacramento and, um, you know, here's this um, early farm labor organizer friend of, um, of Elaine's, you know, driving her to Sacramento to pick up um, her husband, you know, who's returned from war. So um, I definitely think those networks of, and those female friendships are an important part of her story. Um, the way, that even even um, at Manzanar, there's a lot of um, of documentation of that. That even while she um, was the recipient of a lot of criticism and opprobrium from people around her, she also made some very she she made a few very close friends, and a few of them were people that Carl and Elaine knew before they entered Manzanar. Um, but you can imagine under those circumstances, and they spent a lot of time together, and 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 a lot of that time they didn't they didn't have that much to do, you know, so socializing was one of the main, you know, they spend a lot of time spending time with one another, getting to know one another. I particularly liked your story about how they spoke Yiddish on the phone to ev evade the, um, the wiretaps of their <laughs> conversations. Um, there's one question about her involvement in the CP after she left the International Labor Defense. And I, and I don't know if he found anything about 
what she did and what her involvement was in the party after that. Um, that was one question in the chat. There's a few other people that are just sort of interested more broadly in that era. Um, and then the organizing she did later in her life. But I think you touched on that already. Yeah, it's also, you know, also say it's one of the, one of the, um, this is, I'll acknowledge a gap in the archives and, and people might, um, there might, again, I'll say there might be people here who know something more about this, but I was very, what I was very puzzled by and looked um, pretty intently for any evidence of like um, their efforts during the McCarthy era. I mean, they're, they definitely, you know, here they are, they're former, they're very well-known communists, right? <laughs> Throughout, um, you know, leading up to the McCarthy era. They, they definitely have a few encounters that they talk about and they're in the, they're, they're in my book about an FBI agent coming to the chicken ranch and Carl basically telling him to take a hike. Um, you know, and, and there were, there were, but there were definitely people in that chicken ranching community who faced um, more, um, what's the word, um, who faced a lot of problems because of their communist activity um, early, you know, earlier. Um, and we don't, <clears throat> I, I almost, I, I'll say this, to some extent, I read that silence as deliberate in their archives, that they don't talk about that era that much, because they were, I think that my sense I got was that they were trying now to fly a bit under the radar of, of all of that. Um, I mean, they definitely were aware of it, knew, you know, knew how wrong it was. Carl mentions that he can only get back to Japan to see his mother, and like, Elaine doesn't even meet Carl's mother till this, I think it's the seventies when they go visit her. And it's partly because Carl can't get a passport until they drop the question, are you or now or have, or have ever been a member of the communist party for him to even get a passport after the man has like served in the US army, it's, a, it's absurd. But um, so, you know, that legacy did carry with them and they're definitely there labor activism carried with them. And they were also very um, significantly involved in the um, anti-nuclear weapons campaigns, you know, having um, known what Carl's mother had been through and so forth. So they were, they were definitely lifelong activists, but I think that, you know, the nature of labor activism in California changed after World War II as well. And, and also, you know, to their credit, they were, um, they were pretty exhausted by then. <laughs> You know, they had been through a lot. So, um, you know, they were, they, and, and they were exhausted and chicken ranching and raising a teenager was, you know, <laughs> took up a lot of their time, right? I do want to point out that there's an incredible amount of conversation happening in the chat about the chicken ranching um, in uh -huh. Luma and around that area. Um, and the story of Saul Mitzberg is raised. Mm -hmm. um, and we um, are encouraged to read about that in um, something that's the CHS is digitized from the ACLU Northern California chapter. Um, and that that might be a, a good topic for a future event. Um, but I did wanna just point to it because it's there's so much there. And Jessica has said a few times in the chat, but I'll just say it you know, verbally um, that we are going to save the chat and we'll share it with you if you email Jessica. Um, and Jessica's put her email in the chat a few times, but maybe Jessica, you just wanna add that one more time and you can write to her and request that because there's so many great links and so much good information. Um, just flying by, because um, we have <laughs> such an incredible community um, that has joined us tonight. Yeah. Um, we have, what do we have here? We have 10 more minutes. Um, I don't know if we want to take maybe one more question. Or how are you feeling, Rachel? Are you are you a little tired? I know that you. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, you know, on I'm, the spot I'm on the adrenaline now. <laughs> I see Robert Cherney's comment about Elaine's FBI file, and and yes, indeed, both um, both Elaine's and Carl's archives. Um, they requested their FBI files under FOIA, and um, they're they're they're. They're fascinating. They're they're heavily redacted, and they also, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll I'll say I'll share my opinion of them. They just they they illuminate what a colossal waste of energy and time and resources. You know, these some of it is just patent lies, like that that Elaine was a prostitute, which wasn't true, just wasn't true. And then you know, in other 
and other things, but it's like recording their comings and goings. So maybe others have had, if you've ever requested files under FOIA, they tend to be this way, but um, it's, it's, it's a particular window onto um, that part of American history that, you know, just like, well, it's hard to believe that someone incredible. was paid a salary to follow one person um, yeah. or, yeah. Um, and then you think of multiply that by the hundreds, thousands of people that were being monitored and surveyed. Um, it's, it's horrifying. And yes, what a colossal amount of money. That we <laughs> I mean, I guess, you know, another, you know, as, as we head towards wrapping up, I, I want to stress something I read, read in my introduction, which is that um, it, it, if I mean, there, there are many reasons why the story is important and, it, and it's important in its own right. Of course, as a historian, I just, uh, it's great to illuminate parts of history, but um, the, the kinds of ways in which this country seems to keep um, rehearsing its anti-immigrant and xenophobic um, policies as though, as though that were a new thing is just always um, astonishing to me. So as myself, um, the child of immigrants and Part of an immigrant, you know, culture in a country that was that was built by immigrants. Um, it was. I, I mean, I really, I started. Um, I started. I guess I started the writing of the book in earnest. I mean, I've been researching it for a long time, but I started writing it in earnest um, during the Trump years. So that was a really, um, you know, the while I'm working on this, learning that children um, separated from their parents at the Mexico border are being detained in sites of uh, former um, World War II, sites of Japanese American incarceration was just really um, horrifying and stunning. And, and, um, and um, yeah, it's just, it was fascinating. Thank you so much. I think we're kind of coming towards the end of our time here. And I just want to thank you, Rachel, so much for sharing your research with us and um, sharing Elaine with us. Um, and thank you, Tanya, also. For this, your oh, this was so fun. I'm definitely going to plug and, the book. And it really is yeah. a hate <laughs> of a book. It's a really it's incredible. Great book. I, I, yeah, I, I have to say, I just sat down for like two straight days and just all my free time was devoted to this book and it's <laughs> remarkable. Great. I loved reading about Elaine and um, so thank you. And thank you, Tanya, as well for being here tonight. I wanted to definitely plug the thank book. Thank you, Tanya. Thank we you, are Rachel. Putting, and we Jessica. are putting the chat, um, the link for the book in the chat um, so that if you all want to go ahead and click that, you can purchase the book there. Um, and um, thank you to our audience for being with us tonight. There was such a rich discussion in this chat. And um, I did save the chat. I think we need to figure out the logistics for that. But um, there was a lot of great information and resources that were shared and lots of knowledge. So wonderful to have such an engaged and, um, you know, knowledgeable audience with us today as well. So thank, thank you, you to Catherine Powell, who's here, who was really um, helpful in the start. I see Barry Nitzberg is here talking about Saul Nitzberg. Um, great to see everyone who's here and many th thanks to uh, just a few again thanks to Tanya and Jessica the California Historical Society SF State Labor Archives um, gosh too many people Arthur Hansen um, you know and many many others um, Ken Khan Ben Kobashigawa um, lots of people who who've just been incredibly generous in, in sharing um, their knowledge of Tommy and Elaine and Carl with me over the years Incredible. And like you mentioned in the beginning, this is, it feels special to us at the California Historical Society as well um, to talk about Elaine's story. And, um, you know, we have our oral histories being digitized at the moment as well. And so looking forward to having those available for everyone in the future too. Fantastic. Um, so I wanted to thank you again, uh, Rachel and Tanya, for a wonderful discussion. And for everyone, I uh, just wanted to mention um, please join us for our next program, which will be on Tuesday, uh, next Tuesday. August 2nd, and it is California Disasters, True Stories of Golden State, State Tragedies and Triumphs with Phyllis J. Perry. Um, to August 2nd at 5.30 p.m. online via Zoom again. So if you're interested, um, you can find the registration link on our website or under upcoming events. Um, and if you enjoyed the program, please consider making a donation to the California Historical Society. Um, your contribution will help us to continue to collect, share, and honor these diverse stories from throughout our state. And we'll put that link in the chat as well. Thank you again, everyone, uh, for joining us. It was a wonderful evening, wonderful Thank discussion. You. I look forward to seeing you all next time. A good evening. Thank you.
Good night. Thank you. Good night.